All right, so here we are, uh, top 10 sins and struggles. This is lesson uh, number 10 of this uh, particular uh, series. And tonight we're going to be looking at the number two uh, issue. And as we do from week to week, we're going to count them down. These are the top 10 that we've had so far. Number 10, laziness. Number nine, anger. Number eight, cursing and gossiping. Number seven, pride. Number six, neglecting church. Number five, there was a tie there, coping with change and coping with conflict, as many people checked off each box there, so we had a tie. Number four, easily discouraged. Number three, over anxious or worry. That was a struggle people were uh, dealing with. And then number two, coming in at number two, overly critical. Isn't that amazing? Overly critical seems to be something that a lot of people um, a lot of people struggle with. So the second highest rated sin that was described and one that people of every age and every gender deal with. You, know, you can be 14 years old and have to deal with being overly critical or you can be 84 years old and deal with the problem of being overly critical. Okay, so let's define the word it's a good place to start. The word criticism itself is neither positive or negative. It comes from the basic idea of criterion. Criterion. A criterion is a standard or a principle by which something or someone can be evaluated. For example, in the engineering field, there are the specifications for a piece of machinery used as a criterion to judge or evaluate the quality or the value of that part made by different companies. And so the parts, you know that you, if you're sending out a bid and so on and so forth, you're looking at the various companies sending you parts, the parts that adhere most closely to the specifications, the criteria, would be judged most valuable, best quality. So a criterion is the standard against which you measure the value of something or someone. That's neither positive nor negative. That's not a moral thing. It just is the way we do things. Now once we understand the idea of, a, of criterion, we can put the problem of criticism into perspective. Criticism is the judging or the evaluating of a person or thing based on certain criterion. So there are two forms of criticism. The first is legitimate criticism. Legitimate criticism, a qualified person makes an informed judgment based on acceptable criterion. For example, a quality control manager examines a product based on manufacturing specifications. How many people work in quality control? It's very important. Companies put out products, you know, those products have to have a certain measure of quality. It's to their advantage that they themselves police themselves and make sure that their products you know, meet a certain standard. That's what quality control, a part of what they do. Another example of legitimate criticism, a teacher corrects a student's assignment on a given subject. That's legitimate criticism. A parent judges the behavior of a child based on the house rules. That's legitimate criticism. A journalist analyzes government policies against the impact on society. Legit criticism. So there are a lot of examples, but I've chosen a few examples of legitimate criticism to put to rest the false notion that it's wrong to criticize. I hear people say that all the time. It's wrong, you, know, you shouldn't criticize. Where do you get that from? Do you live in the real world? There are many examples, as I said, to demonstrate, I've just given you a few here, to demonstrate that there is such a thing as legitimate Criticism. Legitimate criticism is very important and it's necessary. 
you know, to test the validity of products, to test the validity of ideas, to test the behavior of people. You know, all these debates that we've had, you know, political debates, you know, say what you want. The purpose of them is to evaluate the legitimacy of each candidate's ideas. It doesn't always work out that way. You know, they, they end up calling each other names a lot of times. But the purpose of it is to allow people to criticize. In other words, to evaluate. Of course, to be legitimate, criticism needs to possess three basic components. First, a criterion for judgment. In other words, for criticism to be legitimate, it must use an acceptable standard in its evaluation. Uh, you know, the old story, you can't judge, you can't compare apples and oranges. That's not a legitimate you know, basis for criticism. Proper criticism needs a consistent and legitimate standard to measure against. Otherwise, it's not fair, it's not good criticism. Secondly, legitimate criticism requires a knowledge of the subject. You know, the more knowledgeable the judge, the more valuable the criticism. You know, part of the work of, quote, experts is to offer criticism within their field of expertise in order to raise the level of quality and to raise the level of knowledge. Criticism, very important. And thirdly, for criticism to be legitimate, a criterion, knowledge of the subject and an unbiased attitude. And there's the problem in the political discussion that we're having, right? It's just that you know, it's so biased, it's so, it's so left or right, you know what I'm saying, that people are having a hard time uh, 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 evaluating the proposals and the ideas of the candidates because those who are criticizing them, a lot of them have an agenda. And that's what's creating a lot of you know, heartburn among, among voters. You know, the most valuable and constructive criticism comes from a knowledgeable and unbiased judge. This is why many companies, especially pharmaceutical companies, have to send their products to outside companies for evaluation. You don't evaluate yourself. You don't evaluate your own product. You send them to someone else. That, that gives you even more credibility when your idea or your product or whatever, when you can say this here has been evaluated by third party. That has nothing to do with me or my company. They're, they're third party. So when criticism contains these basic elements, it serves its purpose, which is to separate and evaluate the good from the bad. Okay. Now, the Bible makes reference to legitimate forms of criticism. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 31, Paul says, but if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. In some of your, uh, in some of your uh, uh, translations, that first word, but if we judged, in some of the virgin, versions it says, uh, examine, if we examined ourselves, and that's a little, a little closer to what the original Greek word means. So that first word examine or judge is from a Greek word which means to distinguish or to discern, to evaluate according to a standard. Paul could have said, but if we criticized ourselves. It, the point I'm making a lot of times is just when we even mention the word criticism, right away people think that's negative. Right away they think that's a bad thing. And I'm trying to say to you, no, it's not a bad thing all by itself. Paul even says, but if we criticized ourselves, evaluated, judged ourselves, right? Then the second word translated judge, you know, we would not be judged, means to condemn as in a court of law. So Paul says that if we criticized our own attitude and conduct in worship, carefully, he says, according to the standard of good conduct, we would not be condemned for our poor conduct. So the point of legitimate criticism is to identify and remove what is lacking, 
what is flawed with the goal of restoring uh, to what is best according to an accepted standard. I mean, what is it that coaches do in any sport? They criticize. They criticize, they evaluate. Uh, 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 they, they, they evaluate and they have a right to evaluate. Why? Well, if you're a baseball coach, if you're a coach, have you seen 1,000 guys bat? Have you seen 10,000 guys bat? You kind of know, you know, you can tell the difference between somebody who knows what they're doing and somebody who isn't. Without the coaching, or take the word coach out, without the quote, criticism, none of the players can, can, can be evaluated properly, can improve. Okay, so let's get the idea here out of our minds that all criticism is bad, no. There is proper criticism and it's important. All right, another type of criticism, and here's where we're getting to what we're talking about, is illegitimate criticism. Now in our survey, I don't think people were concerned about giving or receiving legitimate criticism. I believe the concern was the problem of illegitimate criticism. Now there are several forms of illegitimate criticism. One is criticism without criterion. This is the most common type of negative criticism. People criticize without cause, without knowledge, without standards. They criticize without thinking, without basis. A lot of people, I've noticed, a lot of people hide their criticism behind the comment that they're just giving an opinion. <laughs> You know when people are saying, they, they're talking to you and they make an, a, you know, a negative criticism and then they say, just saying, I'm just saying. What they're saying is, I'm just giving my opinion. But in this case, an opinion is simply another word for criticism. But some people think that if they wrap their criticism in an opinion, they won't have to take responsibility for what they've just said. In other words, they won't get called on it. I was just saying, it was just an opinion. I'm allowed to give an opinion, yeah. But you're not allowed to give a negative criticism based on nothing other than your own thinking wrapped in what you say is an opinion. No, you're not allowed to do that. So if you have no knowledge <clears throat> and you have no standard, it's better to ask questions or just remain silent. What does Solomon say in Proverbs 17, 28? Even a fool, when he keeps silent, is considered wise. I love that one. I'll repeat it. Even a fool, when he keeps silent, is considered wise. So criticism without knowledge or criterion is ignorance. Another uh, form of illegitimate criticism is constant criticism. Some people judge and criticize because that's what they do. <laughs> they think they were put on earth to do that. Criticism is their main form of communication and expression. <laughs> How's it going today? Well, I don't know, boy, I tell you the sun was late. Yeah. It's as if they are compelled to judge and criticize every experience they have or every person they come in contact with. They meet somebody for the first time, somebody, Joe, introduces Bill over here to Mike, you know, oh, hey, how are you, blah, 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 and then you know, Bill goes away and Mike is talking to Joe and said, nice guy, but I don't know, man. Talks awfully loud, doesn't he? You know, it's like they're compelled to offer a criticism on every single thing that takes place. Here the problem is twofold. The problem is twofold. One, no one person has enough knowledge to legitimately criticize everything and everybody. Only God has that kind of knowledge. And two, these people are mostly negative in their criticism. Even in their positive opinions, 
there's always a but. Yeah, that Bill, a oh, nice guy, but. You know, there are times when criticism is needed, but if that's all a person produces, then it cannot be legitimate. Because constant criticism is usually a sign that a person is not happy with themselves and criticizing everything is a way of deflecting the criticism one feels for oneself. You know, if I criticize everything and everybody, maybe that'll you know, blow enough smoke up in the air that it won't come back to me. So we have criticism without any criterion. And then we have constant criticism. And then another type is condemning criticism. And this is the most damaging because it may be based on acceptable standards and the critic may have some knowledge or ex expertise. The problem is that the judgment, the criticism, is formed and framed negatively and hurtfully. I mean, let's face it, since perfection isn't possible, it's easy to always frame our critique in a negative way. I mean, the easiest thing to do is to criticize something negative, negatively. Why? Because there's nothing that's perfect. I'll give you an example, I think, uh, you know, an example that all of us can kind of uh, relate to. I mean, the, the show now is losing its popularity. I think it's going off the air, but remember American Idol? Everybody saw American Idol on TV, big, big show for what, 10 years now, something like that. And, and the reason people were watching American Idol, especially at the beginning, yeah, it was for the singing, sure, it was for this and that, but it was really for Simon Cowell, the British music industry you know, individual who had the most biting criticism. I mean, you'd watch TV and he'd say something to somebody and you'd be watching TV going, whoa, wow, that was rough, oof. Now, here's the thing about Simon Cowell. He had knowledge. He knew the music business. He knew show business. He had expertise because he had guided other musicians and singers and entertainers you know, in their career. So he wasn't just talking through his hat. He knew about the entertainment industry. He was an expert, if you wish. Um, but his criticisms were always framed in negative terms. Even his compliments to one insulted a whole bunch of others. You know, he said, well, you know, she's the best of a bad bunch. <laughs> I mean, like, she's the best of a bad bunch? So negative criticisms often go beyond judging to condemnation and from condemnation to hurt. I mean, his words to some of these young people, singers, whatever they were, I mean, some of them, you could tell that they were hurt deeply. And I mean, to be shamed like that, to be embarrassed like that, in front of millions of people, I mean, that thing stays with you. I mean, if somebody just says something to you in front of one other person, you know, and, and they do it in a hurtful way, maybe afterwards you get them together and say, you know, I didn't appreciate what you said, and I understand you know, maybe I did something wrong here, but I really appreciate it in the future. If you just come to me, you know, tell me by myself, you don't have to call me down you know, in front of my friend or in front of my, you know, whatever. Imagine having that done to you in front of, the entire, in front of 20 million people which would include all your family, friends, relatives, you know, who are watching you. So condemning criticism is the type that is always framed in negative terms. Now here's my point on that one. This is what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 7, verses one to five. And we'll read that. He says, do not judge, could put in here, Criticize, you can replace that word, take, remember we took that word judge and put in the word criticize, same thing. Do not judge so that you will not be judged, for in the way you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? 
Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye and behold the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Now some people always use this here uh, to say this is the Lord making a command that we should never judge anyone or anybody. I hear that all the time. You call yourself a Christian, boy. You know, doesn't Jesus say, thou shalt not judge? Well, he doesn't say thou shalt not judge, but you know, they're always referring to this particular passage. They think that this passage supports the toleration of all kinds of social and moral misconduct. So you were wrong if you criticized the gay lifestyle, for example. Why? Oh, because the Bible says, you know, thou shalt not judge. Jesus says you shouldn't judge, you know, you, you shouldn't judge me. And you're wrong if you criticize someone's poor attitude towards others or their work. Always the same thing. The Bible says you shouldn't judge. But what Jesus is saying what he's saying is, be careful how you judge. He didn't say you mustn't judge. He said, be careful how you judge, not don't ever judge. You need to be careful because you too will be judged. That's what he's saying. Judgment, you know, it's, pretty sharp, uh, it's a pretty sharp sword, judgment. Be careful how you wield it because it's going to be wielded against you as well. And he also says in verse three and four, don't judge with a beam, meaning a negative attitude or ignorance or prejudice in your, in your eye. You know, I've, I've criticized, judged uh, the gay lifestyle, but I've also written a book about the gay lifestyle and done a lot of research about the gay lifestyle. And I've looked at the, the history of uh, the politics of this particular move, uh, movement. I've, I've looked at the, you know, the argument, na uh, you know, nature versus nurture, is it genetic? And I've done research and tried to find some sort of genetic proof you know, that someone is actually born that way and to this day still have not found it. There's still no genetic proof that someone is born gay. So my, my point is, yes, yes, I have made criticisms about this lifestyle, but my criticism is not based in ignorance. I have some knowledge about this. And my criticism is not based on hatred. My criticism, as I think all of ours, when it comes to this particular issue, is based in love. Because if I do not say to you, this is sin, this is wrong, you, you need to deal with this thing, then when you come to judgment, God will condemn you for this. And I'll be condemned if I remain silent and say nothing. So I don't have a thing about gays or homosexuals. I don't have a secret hatred of that. I see that as a sin. I see that as a moral force in our society that's creating havoc. And so I speak out against the action. Someone says, well, you, 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 you listen to music you know, by individuals who are, who are gay. You know? You're a hypocrite. No, I'm not. I didn't say that you have to discount every single thing in a, in a gay person's life. If they're an artist, I can appreciate their art. If they're doctors, I can appreciate and even avail myself of their services. The point that I criticize is the moral point of their lifestyle choice when it comes to human sexuality, period. That's, that's where that is. And then Jesus says, first, evaluate yourself and this will enable you to recognize and eliminate your beam, in other words, your prejudice, your ignorance, so you can render a fair and accurate criticism. My judgment would be hypocrisy if, in making my criticism of this lifestyle, I myself were consuming uh, child pornography, for example. 
See what I'm saying? There, there would be a huge beam in my eye there if I criticized their lifestyle, but secretly I was consuming another type of sexual perversion. And haven't we seen this so many times? National religious leaders who are you know, leading the, 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 the movement to, to denounce homosexual lifestyle, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden that guy, that same guy gets caught you know, molesting children or consuming pornography. Yeah, that's, you know, what does a guy like that do? Well, first of all, shut up. <laughs> Be quiet and deal with your own sin. So negative criticism is justified if it comes from a person who is aware of the criterion for judgment and keeps an eye on himself or herself to make sure that the criticism is fair and does not become simple condemnation and bullying. Like I said, criticism is a very sharp sword. You have to you know, use it carefully because you can hurt someone and you can hurt yourself. So as Christians, you know, we know that criticism is sometimes necessary and when done correctly, it can be quite helpful. We can, however, avoid the temptation to become people who are given to too much or too negative in criticizing other people if we remember a couple of simple rules about the use of criticism in general. And here's the, in all of these lessons, you know, we talk about the problem as we've talked about you know, criticism tonight, legitimate forms of criticism, illegitimate forms of criticism, you know, to kind of analyze the problem a little bit. And then hopefully we try with you know, a couple of ideas of how do I deal with that? If that's my problem, if I find myself always defaulting to a negative opinion about people or things, if I, if I, if I love to criticize, that's all I do, constant, you know, if that's my problem, what are some of the things I can do? Other than understanding that this is maybe a problem of mine, what else can I do? Well, here's some other things you can do to kind of tamper this very human weakness that many of us have down. First of all, use criticism sparingly. Yes, the Bible doesn't say thou shalt not criticize. Yeah, we're, we're not, we're not you know, God doesn't demand that we never criticize, but we need to use it sparingly. No matter how much expertise and insight you have or how fair you are about it, Nobody likes to receive criticism, nobody. Even if it's 100% true and they know it, nobody likes to be told where they're wrong or where they're weak, nobody likes it. Now there's no rule that says that you have to give your opinion on everything. When it comes to criticism, the old saying, you know, less is more, truly applies. So one way to break yourself from the habit of being overly critical is to offer your criticism only under the following circumstances. Ready? A, use criticism when your criticism will save a person from evil of some kind. In other words, when your criticism may help a person avoid harming themselves hurting themselves, sinning against God in some way. <laughs> Secondly, use criticism when your criticism is based on your true expertise, whatever that is. Some people think that their expertise is the giving of criticism. <laughs> they don't know nothing about nothing except how to critique people. So it doesn't matter if it's your golf game or if it's how you mow your lawn or you know what I'm saying? They have an opinion. So make sure if you're going to give criticism, it's really about an area that you know something about. And then thirdly, when so use criticism when someone actually asks you for your opinion. That's the hardest part. Parents of grown children, that's the most difficult thing to do, to bite your tongue and not give your opinion when you have not been asked 
your opinion. The point I make here is, you know what? You manage to learn and get to where you are, and they will too. Following these rules for the times that you offer criticism will greatly reduce those times, and along with them, the trouble caused by improper criticism. So number one, use criticism sparingly. Number two, balance your criticism. I think, I think most people know where I'm going with this. Of course, there's always something negative that you can base your entire judgment on. This is an imperfect, sinful world, yes. But the, but the, 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 the better, um, uh, the bitter, excuse me, but the bitter will be so much more palatable if you provide some sweetness to help the medicine go down. Sometimes there is a need to make a judgment call on someone's sin or failure and you are the right person to do this. However, if a, a ray of hope and encouragement are provided along with the bad, a person is not left feeling completely lost or defeated. When you're giving a critique to someone, you're not beating them up. You know, in the Old Testament, all the prophets, if you read the prophets and if you read their prophecies you know, in a critical way, you'll notice something very interesting. When the prophets are chastising the Israelites for their sins and their moral failures, they would follow a pattern. Okay? Their, their writing followed a pattern. They would begin by listing the offenses that the nation had committed. They then would warn them of the terrible and sure punishment that God was going to lay onto the people because of their failures. But they would always finish, always finish with the promise that God would eventually restore them to a position of hope one day. Even at the worst moment when Jeremiah was saying to the southern kingdom, you people are lost, you people are in idolatry, God is going to come in and He's going to destroy the city and the temple, He's going to wipe you off the face of the earth and you will be brought into exile. But then he says, but 70 years later, but 70 years later, God in His mercy will take a remnant and will bring you back and you'll rebuild the city, and you'll rebuild the temple, and each man will have his vine, and each man will have his olive tree, and you know, there, there's always a ray of hope there. So balanced criticism builds a person up because a fair assessment of both the bad and the good is made about them when it is needed. So a good rule here is to include two good things for each negative thing, so that the net result is hope for the future from the uh, base of good things that are now present. And I know that's hard to do. It's always harder to find two or three good things to talk about. It's easy to get two or three negative, but you know, believe me, a couple of good things and just one negative thing usually is about as much as a person can take. And then number three, we finish out here, Always criticize self first. If you feel the need to talk to brother or sister so-and-so about a particular thing, you're going to make a critique, you know that it's true, you have some, so on and so forth, the best type of critique is the one that has taken a long look at self first. When we do this, we tend to be a little more merciful and a little more humble in our approach to the person we're about to offer our criticism to. Paul says in Romans 2.1, therefore you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment, for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same things. So Paul says that there's no excuse for the, uh, for the one who criticizes someone else for the things that he excuses in himself. Though usually when we see ourselves, we're less prone to criticize others, and when we do, as I say, we're a little more generous. A little more generous. And then one last thing, number four. So use criticism sparingly, balance your criticism, always look at yourself first, and then realize that Jesus, He's the true criterion. 
The problem with criticism and judgment and opinion, especially of other people, is that we tend to use ourselves or our best image of ourselves as the criterion. You know, if I use myself as the standard and judge everybody by my standard, even if it's 100% true, it, it won't be accepted. So if we compare and judge ourselves and others to Jesus as the standard, then there'll be no jealousy, there'll be no negative envy, there'll be no false criticism. If I'm saying to my brother, brother, I am trying to be like the Lord in this way, and I encourage you to try to be like the Lord in this way, how can he be angry at me? I'm exhorting this brother to do you know, what I'm doing towards the Lord. I mean, we all fall short of God's glory. We're all in need of His mercy. I think everybody knows that. So this, this attitude creates patience and mercy, kindness, long-suffering, forgiveness towards other people. Instead of criticism, there's concern. Instead of judgment, there's joy that no matter what our failings, all of us have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. So in the end, you know, when the beam is removed from our own eye, we see all men as Christ sees them, the objects of His mercy and sal salvation. And I tell you this, if Jesus isn't criticizing me anymore, then you shouldn't be criticizing me anymore, unless I'm disobeying Jesus. So we're, we're always exhorting each other to be our best selves in Christ. And I think when, we, when, when our criticism is, is couched in these type of terms, it'll be acceptable to other people. Okay, so there's some information about over-criticism and some of the things we can do.